probably couldn't even, like a bird like a condor, probably couldn't even pick up a small boy because they don't have grasping talons. They have kind of turkey feet, which are designed for grasping. And that probably what happened was that a turkey vulture came down and picked him up and used his momentum to carry him for a few feet. Well, pretty much everybody in here, I'm sure, knows what a turkey vulture looks like and has probably seen a turkey vulture on a daily basis. I see them every day in Texas. Turkey vultures are impressive birds, but they do not have a 15, 10, 15 foot wingspan, and they're easily identifiable. So, um, the poor marlin received a lot of uh, flack, or the Lowe family did over the years. Uh, marlin appeared with me on an episode of Monster Quest back in 2010 uh, as an adult, and he's, you know, still sticks to his story that this giant bird came down and picked him up off the ground. And interestingly enough, there were a lot of sightings after the Marlin Low, the Lawndale incident, uh, for a series of about a week and a half or two weeks, there were a number of other Thunderbird sightings throughout central Pennsylvania. Now in the, uh, in the upper left hand corner here is a frame from a film. This is the only alleged photographic evidence of a Thunderbird. And the story here is that on July 25th, um, I'm sorry, July 29th, just a few days after the Lawndale incident, a man named Texas John Huffer was at a place called Lake Shelbyville, Illinois, and he's a, a Native American man, and he's also a, uh, what they call a stringer for the local news channel. So he always had a, a movie camera with him in case he needed to film some footage for the, for the local news broadcast. And as he was boating up this inlet in the northern part of Lake Shelbyville, he saw these two giant birds perched in the trees. And uh, he began to film them and film them actually taking off from these two trees and taking off into the air. Now the, evi the photographic evidence is very controversial. Initially you can see these two birds with the background of the trees. So you can get a pretty good idea of the scale. And let me tell you my personal opinion, they're not turkey vultures. These things, their wingspan is enormous. But as they take off into the air, of course, you lose a, a concept of size and scale and you can't really tell how big these birds are. Uh, well, once again, the trusty wildlife biologist stepped in and said, you filmed a couple of turkey vultures, that's all they are. And um, again, this footage was featured on that same episode of Monster Quest, uh, and actually I think it's 2007, 2008, on a early season, a first season of Monster Quest. And two giant bird experts uh, said that yes, they were turkey vultures. The third bird expert who works at a raptor center in Minnesota said, those are not turkey vultures. I don't know what those are. They look like about the size of condors. Um, the footage is hard to find. Through the years, Texas John Huffer has tried to make money off the footage by selling it online. So it's not something that you, you might be able to find it on YouTube, I don't know. But um, um, it's unfortunately, like most photographic evidence, it's just not conclusive. But again, my own opinion is when you first see the birds take off, look at the wingspan and the size of these birds compared to the background of these trees, they really do look much larger than anything I think that's accepted by modern science. Now in the right hand corner, right hand side here, I, I included a uh, newspaper article from 1948 because Illinois not only had a series or flap of big bird sightings in the 1970s, but back in uh, April of 1948, several people around St. Louis and other parts of Illinois claimed that they saw monster-sized birds flying through the air, including two army colonels at, all, at a air base in Alton, Illinois, claimed that this bird flew over and it looked like a B-29 bomber. So again, Illinois has a long history and tradition of Thunderbird sightings, and I've documented some never-before-published uh, Thunderbird sightings from Illinois in my new book. And then we get to my home state of Texas. And again, I live in San Antonio. There have traditionally been a lot of sightings of big bird around San Antonio. Uh, the sightings originated back in, down in the Rio Grande Valley, right in the border with Mexico. Um, January 1st, 1976, two young girls, Tracy Lawson and Jackie Davis, were playing in their backyard when they claimed they saw a five foot tall bird leering at them. Uh, they ran inside to try to wake their parents, but their parents were evidently sleeping off New Year's Eve and didn't want to get out of bed. So, uh, But they did go out later and find some giant footprints that were uh, filmed and broadcast on the local news channel. On January 7th, uh, a few days later, a gentleman in Brownsville, Texas, named Al Alvarico Guajardo, was in his trailer home when he heard a, something thud against the side. And he went outside, 
um, didn't have a flashlight, so he turned on the headlights of his car, and according to him, he saw something that looked like, quote, a bird, but not a bird, something not of this earth. And uh, so eventually the thing kind of, it didn't take off flying, it backed off into the darkness. And perhaps in the most dramatic encounter on January 14, 1976, a gentleman named Armando Grimaldo was in Raymondville, Texas, and he was out uh, smoking a cigarette on his back porch, and he heard the sound of wind flapping, and he looked up, and this giant winged creature descended on him and attacked him, ripping and tearing his clothes and scratching him. And he had to be rushed to the Willisee County Hospital because he was in shock. Those sightings continued for several weeks. Uh, the final sighting occurred in San Antonio on February 24, 1976. Three school teachers on their way to work pulled over to the side of the road to get out of their cars and observe two giant birds circling over some cattle. And according to them, they looked like pterodactyls. So you have a lot of, um, in the Thunderbird mythology, or Thunderbird lore, you have a lot of descriptions of these giant birds, but you also have people occasionally saying that these things, no, they're not birds, they look like leathery wings, bat-like, kind of like prehistoric, you know, like pterodactyls, which of course were flying reptiles that were contemporary with the dinosaurs millions of years ago. And again, I, I continue to receive big bird sightings to this day. Recently, a gentleman named Marcos Rodriguez contacted me and told me that a, a giant bird swooped down on him in the 1980s when he was a young boy in his backyard. So very similar to the Lawndale incident. I'm probably scaring the heck out of you people because I keep talking about the accounts where these things swoop down and attack kids. And, you know, historically, there are a lot of, if you check, there are accounts going back to the 1800s of children being carried away by giant eagles um, and so forth. So there's kind of a history there. And this is an artist's interpretation of what I refer to as an enormous eagle or a thunderbird swooping down on a deer. Um, very recently, I was uh, on a television show called Missing in Alaska. Some of you may have caught that. And we did an episode on thunderbird sightings in Alaska. I've been getting a lot of uh, thunderbird accounts from very credible people in Alaska over the past decade, including hunters, uh, a guy that worked as a park ranger at Denali Park, and so forth. And these are people, keep in mind, these are people that know what turkey vultures look like, they know what eagles look like. They're familiar with wildlife and fauna. So when someone like that sees a bird that size and says this was five times bigger, three to five times bigger than any known bird, that's kind of impressive, right? Okay, here's a little self-gratuitous plug here. So this is my, um, my first book on the left here, which I have available for sale. It's called Big Bird, Modern Sightings of Flying Monsters. I wrote it in 2007, and um, I went down to the Rio Grande Valley, and I actually found some of the original Thunderbird, Big Bird eyewitnesses, and I interviewed many people in the area. Now, for the particular theme of this book, if you notice, you look at the cover of the book, it doesn't look like a bird at all. It does, in fact, look like a pterosaur, which, again, is a winged reptile that lived during the Cretaceous period very successful. The pterosaurs were around for like 150 million years. They filled the same niche that birds fill today. But they were reptiles, and many of them had long reptilian tails, they had teeth. Uh, there was a specific type called a ramphorinkoid, which had this long reptilian tail with a fin on the end. And um, although the big bird sightings in South Texas in many ways echo and mirror thunderbird sightings, my conclusion on that particular investigation was that more people seem to be describing these pterosaur, these reptilian types of things. So that was kind of the, the slant or the lean I took with that particular book. And to this day, it's very confusing because I get reports of both. I have people that, that contact me and they say that they've seen these giant, dark, feathered birds that look like condors or vultures or eagles with an enormous 15 or 20 foot wingspan and a hooked beak. I also get many reports from people that claim that they've seen pterodactyls or pterosaurs, basically bat-winged, reptilian creatures that, that don't look like birds, but superficially similar to birds. And I guess it, you know, it would be ambiguous in terms of if you consider, for example, that a pterosaur or pterodactyls, obviously they have wings, they're very different, the structure of the wings are very different from a bird. For example, a pterosaur's wings are actually um, similar to a bat, it's its hand, with a thin membrane of skin stretched over and one long, imagine if your pinky finger stretched down to the ground, they have that super long pinky finger. But 
our recent studies on pterosaurs have found that, you know, looking at pterosaur fossils, that many pterosaurs actually had a feather-like covering on their bodies, known as pycnophibers. These were like, they weren't real feathers, but they were kind of like proto-feathers. So consider that pterosaurs may have actually looked very similar to birds. And of course, all of you who have seen Jurassic Park know that dinosaurs evolved into birds. So, you know, archosaurs, which include the crocodilians and so forth, related to birds. So there are some kind of close relations there. But what's really befuddling to me as a researcher is I have a giant map of North America on my wall in my apartment, and I have thumbtacks where I color-coded thumbtacks. Black ones are big birds, birds, and red ones are pterosaurs. And strangely enough, the sightings overlap. The concentrated activity of Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and you know, other areas, Texas, you have reports of thunderbirds and pterosaurs overlapping. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe you have uh, some crossover effect where people are misidentifying one way or the other. And I haven't decided which, which way I want to go yet. Um, it's harder to accept that pterosaurs are still around because they disappeared from the fossil history 65 million years ago. And that's a long time for, for nothing to leave a fossil, right? But there are giant birds, and we'll discuss those in a moment. There were giant birds in North America a mere 10 or 11,000 years ago, which really isn't that long. I mean, that's like a blink of an eye in geological time. Um, oh, and this is uh, the cover of my new book, A Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts. And in that book, there's an entire chapter dedicated to these thunderbirds and also some pterosaur sightings. And in fact, I've many, many never before published firsthand eyewitness accounts, people that have come forward, that have had the courage to come forward and say, I don't care what people think, I saw a giant bird with a 15 foot wingspan, I know what I saw. And uh, many of these people, to their credit, I asked them, do you want me to use a pseudonym? I'll disguise your name, I'll keep you confident. No, I, I wanna own this, I know what I saw. People can think what they want, but I saw this giant bird or whatever. So, um, one of the benefits, as you can imagine, of being on television and writing books about this stuff, and I also, I'm on a show called Coast to Coast AM, frequently talking about this, people get in touch with me. They say, I, I can't believe I was driving down the road and I heard you talking about these giant birds and I almost crashed because I realized that I'd seen one of those things, so. Okay, so now we have to talk about, a little bit about traditional zoology in order to do some critical thinking here and eliminate some things. So, many of you are probably aware of the fact that when the Mothman sightings first surfaced, uh, a professor uh, at a university here in West Virginia, um, and I think he was also the lead singer for The Cure, because his name was Robert Smith, but he came forward and said, oh, what people are seeing is a sandhill crane. It's a large bird that has these red dots on its head. It's not native to West Virginia on its migration pattern, but maybe there was one that went astray, and this is what people are seeing. Well, the sandhill crane, scientific name is Grus canadensis, is, it's a big bird. I mean, it stands about five feet tall. It has a wingspan that's maybe six, seven feet across. But it looks very different from what anyone in the Mothman case has described, right? It's, it's kind of a multicolored piebald bird. It's got a long neck, long legs and so forth. So it's very hard for me to accept that this is in fact what the Mothman was. Very, very hard to accept that. Okay, so now let's talk about the giant owl theory. I don't know if any of you have heard this or not, but um, there have been a number of people that have come out and tried to explain the Mothman as misidentifications of an owl. Well, first I'm going to address the really ludicrous claims of a skeptic, a noted skeptic named Joe Nickel who claimed that the Mothman was a barred owl. People saw a barred owl out of the team. A barred owl is this big, guys. I find it really hard to believe that people were driving around the TNT area and saw an owl this big and said, ah, it's a monster, let's get to town. So that's kind of ludicrous. I'm not gonna really even address that theory. It's just ridiculous. But um, a colleague of mine by the name of Mark Hall, who wrote an excellent book about Thunderbirds, um, has a theory that there is a giant species of owl that he calls Big Hoot. And Big Hoot, according to him, is a man-sized owl, and that's what the Mothman was. The people were seeing this giant owl that was like six feet tall, and it had big red eyes. And if you, you can see the similarity here in terms of the traditional interpretation of what the Mothman 
looks like, and an interpretation of a large owl with red eyes. And in fact, um, Mark Hall uh, suggests that the largest owl that ever lived, its fossils have been found in Cuba, Cuba was called Ornimegalonyx. And this particular owl stood about th just over three feet tall. So again, for me personally, that's a big stretch to say, okay, this owl was three feet tall, so now we have a six foot owl that's running around out here in West Virginia. Moreover, the really troubling aspect is that Orgamenolonyx, according to reconstructions, had very long legs and was basically a terrestrial owl. So it couldn't even really fly. It could maybe fly for short distances, but it was basically running around on the ground. So again, and I respect the heck out of Mark Hall. He's an amazing researcher and he's done some, some incredible work through the years. But I have to dispute this possibility that this giant terrestrial owl from Cuba is in any way related to the Mothman. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I do have in my database just a few ambiguous reports or sightings of giant owls five feet tall, one from the Florida Everglades, one from North Texas, one from Ohio. Um, but they're very rare, very, very rare do I get reports of giant owls to that size and scale. And here I am holding a, uh, the largest owl from Europe and Asia is the Eurasian Eagle Owl and Bubo Bubo, scientific name. And this is a pretty big owl. It's got about a five or six foot wingspan. It's very aggressive. Um, and you know, owls can be very scary. I'm sure some of you people driving home or walking through the woods at night have startled an owl and it takes off and you're like, wow, that's, a cra that's crazy, that's a huge bird. But again, it's still hard for me to accept that the Mothman could be attributed to encounters with owls. Now there's a story that some of you may have heard uh, that surfaced uh, after the Mothman Prophecies movie came out. Uh, a lady from Point Pleasant came forward and said that her husband actually shot a giant owl on their property that was attacking their pets, their pet cats, right around the time of the Mothman incident. And they were scared that they would get in trouble with the authorities. So they didn't report this and they buried this giant owl on their property. And ultimately there was a house built over the location. So that's one story about the giant owl. But again, harder for me to accept that that's our, our culprit. Okay, so let's address the fact that there are some pretty decently large birds in North America. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we have the great blue heron, uh, Ardea herodias is the Latin name, and they have about a five, maybe a six foot wingspan, pretty darn big, but very recognizable, right? In the upper right hand corner, you have the golden eagle, Aquila chrysatos, and these birds can have a, an eight foot wingspan, they are native to this area, and what's more is they have very powerful grasping talons but even the largest golden eagle only weighs about 30 pounds. And the rule of raptors is that giant birds can only pick up about half their body weight. So you hear stories about eagles carrying away small fawns and deer and things like that, but you know, 15 pounds is about the limit, the top limit of a large raptor picking something off and carrying it away. Now some birds will knock animals off cliffs. They don't actually pick them up, but they'll knock them off a cliff and then go down and peck away at them at the bottom of the cliff. So an eagle is a possibility, um, maybe for some of the sightings, but um, again, in the Lawndale incident, you know, Marlon Lowe weighed 60 pounds, so that means you would have to have an eagle that weighs 120 pounds. So that doesn't really add up. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner here, we have uh, uh, the wood stork, again, a native bird, uh, Mycteria americana, Latin name. And these have a pretty good wingspan, about seven feet across. We have a, a, a migrating stork in South Texas called a, a Jabiru stork that has a, a, about an eight foot wingspan. I've seen one of those up close and it was pretty impressive. And then in the lower right hand corner, we have the California condor. And many people have suggested the Thunderbird legends can be attributed to California condors. Well, scientists and ornithologists admit that California condors once had a range much wider than today. So today they're native to Southern California, Baja, Mexico, the Grand Canyon, Arizona, Utah. But at one time, condor fossils had been found as far north as New York. So we know that condors were once widespread across North America. But again, condors don't have powerful grasping talons. Moreover, condors have very noticeable white, kind of white patterns on the underside of their wings. Now they do have a bald head, which many people describe with report to the Thunderbirds. 
But in modern times, as you know, uh, California condors are greatly endangered. And there's only about 400 living California condors. And those condors, as you can imagine, are very closely monitored by wildlife specialists. And in fact, most of them have tags and numbers and are assigned. And they're watched on a regular basis. And the thought that a condor would travel from California to West Virginia, I don't really see a lot of sense there in terms of, you know, the, the habitats that condors inhabit are typically very high, craggy mountain peaks. Because they're so big and heavy, they require those thermal updrafts of air. They kind of fall off the cliff and then they use those, those air uh, thermals to kind of get some lift and get some, uh, some elevation. But we do have some candidates in the prehistoric past, as I mentioned. Now this is a reconstruction of a bird that lived during the Miocene epoch, and this was probably about 20 million years ago. But this particular fo bird, uh, fossils have been found in uh, Argentina, and its uh, scientific name is Argentavis magnificens. And this is the largest bird that ever flew. It had a wingspan about 24 feet across, which kind of matches the descriptions of the Thunderbird. And it was related to modern uh, vultures and condors, and also related to storks. All those birds are kind of related. Now, Argentavis was very heavy, and it probably spent a lot of its time on the ground hopping around, and it was a predator. If you look at its, uh, it had a very hooked beak, uh, probably ate you know, small mammals and things like that. There was a North American version, though, too. And the North American version of Thunderbird, or I'm sorry, of what they called Teratorns, lived about, during the Pleistocene epoch, during the Ice Age, about 10, 11,000 years ago. And we have found hundreds of their fossils throughout California, in the La Brea Tar Pits, uh, in Nevada, Oregon, and Florida. And these birds uh, typically had a wingspan. Teratornis mariami had a wingspan of about 12 feet across, but the largest species, which is called Aeolornis, had a wingspan of about 18 feet across. So, um, like many fossil animals, a lot of what we assume about these prehistoric animals is just that. It's assumption, it's speculation. I work with people who are paleontologists, and they told me frankly that, you know, we just don't know a lot about you know, prehistoric animals. We speculate based on their fossil finds, how big they were, what they ate, where they lived, and so forth. But um, the Teratorns uh, have been found in the La Brea Tar Pits, were probably attacking animals that got stuck in the tar, things like mammoths and stuff, you know, large animals, Pleistocene megafauna animals like that. So the real question then is, could some of these Teratorn birds have survived their presumed extinction date of 10, 11,000 years ago and survived into the past, creating the Thunderbird legend among the Native Americans. And moreover, could some of these giant birds have survived to the present day? Now, turning on my skeptical side here, uh, playing devil's advocate, this is very hard to accept because Teratorns, um, if a bird with an 18-foot wingspan existed, we would certainly be seeing them more often, I would think. Um, moreover, we have not found any evidence of a giant nest, of a giant feather, of a giant eggshell, or of a giant massive pile of bird crap on, on our windshields. So, you know, there's just, there's no physical evidence, and that's, of course, from a, from a scientific point of view, that's very troubling, because if these birds did exist, you would have to have a minimal number of birds, right, individuals, in order to maintain a viable breeding population, and moreover, to maintain genetic diversity. So there's no genetic bottlenecking, so that these birds maintain a healthy breeding stock. And um, however, that said, if these giant birds do exist, um, then this probably is our still our best candidate, because they're really, you know, now I wanna also, add that certainly in the case of Mothman, in the case of other big bird sightings reports, there must be some accounts that are misidentifications. There certainly are cases where people get excited, they have a fleeting encounter with something, their adrenaline's pumping and you know their imagination takes over and they say, oh, this thing was huge, it had a 20 foot wingspan, whatever. And uh, we've already acknowledged that things are very hard to judge when they're high up in the air, right? Because you have to know the distance, you have to have some point of reference to say, okay, that bird is, I 
against a telephone pole, but people have described these Thunderbirds perched on things as well. So, um, by the way, this is a San Diego Zoo. Uh, this is a reconstruction of a territory that I'm kind of sitting on here. Um, so, if these Thunderbirds do exist, um, they would probably live, I would think, in remote mountainous areas, which is why they wouldn't you know, be seen as often and why the evidence hasn't been found. <clears throat> Moreover, I personally get the feeling that the number of Thunderbird reports that I have in my database, which is probably in the low hundreds, is barely scratching the surface of the number of Thunderbird encounters. Because think about it, there is definitely a ridicule factor associated with these situations. Say you're driving home and you see this giant bird with a 20-foot wingspan take off from the side of the road. Well, I've had many eyewitnesses tell me that when they got home and told their family or their husband or their friends that, oh man, you're crazy. There's no way. You know, they weren't even believed by their spouses and their family members. It's just, it's impossible. You couldn't have seen a bird that big. So obviously a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about this stuff. Moreover, unlike Bigfoot or Sasquatch or some of the other cryptids I investigate, there's not a lot of familiarity with the subject matter. So, for example, everyone knows about Bigfoot. So if you thought you saw Bigfoot, you might not tell anybody. You might keep it to yourself. Maybe you would eventually, if you were talking to someone like me or a Bigfoot researcher, you'd say, you know what, I've seen one of those and come forward with it. I think when people see these giant birds that they don't always make the connection that this is an unidentified animal. They see the bird take off and they're like, wow, did you see that bird? That was crazy. That thing had like a 15-foot wingspan. Wow. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> to keep driving down the road. So uh, I really literally think that there are, you know, thousands of, if these things exist, there are thousands of people out there that have had sightings and encounters that have just literally never talked about it. Um, I guess those are the main points that I wanted to make. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment, because I am a very open-minded person, and if some of you have read my book about flying humanoids, I personally address, you know, the, the belief that Mothman must be some type of supernatural entity. Whether you want to call it an extraterrestrial or interdimensional or a demon or whatever, there's just too much weird stuff associated with the Mothman. When you look at all of the UFO sightings, men in black, just the behavior of the Mothman. Witnesses described it as taking off straight off the ground with no, you know, momentum and chasing cars at 100 miles an hour and it had giant glowing red eyes that transfixed people. And then there were men in black threatening eyewitnesses and all this. So, and of course the tragedy of the Silver Bridge, which many people associate with Mothman. So all of that taken in its entirety is very hard to say that Mothman was definitively, you know, this, that, or, or, or the other. But, you know, for my money, if there are things in our world and our universe, and I think everyone in this room acknowledges there are things in our world and our universe that we just don't understand. We can't comprehend them, we haven't discovered them yet, whatever. So Mothman falls deeply into that category, and therefore I think that the Mothman, the traditional Mothman that was cited by initially and so forth, was some type of manifestation of energy, an apparition from who knows where, and then it you know, dissipated, and there are still occasionally sightings and so forth. But, as with most things I investigate, the chupacabra, the Jersey Devil, and some of these other creatures, they are often cases of composite identity, meaning that you have a lot of different things that are being classified or labeled under the same category. So, for example, it's possible that there was this supernatural winged entity that appeared uh, in November of 1966 here in the Point Pleasant area. And it's also possible that Thomas Urey was driving home a few days later and sighted a Thunderbird flying over the trees by chance. And that sighting got kind of swept up into the Mothman lore. So we have, you know, I just think we have to consider all those angles that there are different aspects to the Mothman phenomenon. And one of those aspects may be sightings of giant unidentified birds. Um, I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I thank you all for coming to my lecture. And if you have any specific questions you'd like me to address, I'm going to be uh, at my table down there with the other speakers. And uh, I invite you to come on by and, and chat with me. So thank you so much. <laughs>